So we have um, uh, another lightning round here with even more people, so we will try to get through this quickly, hit on some high points, and uh, take questions from the audience. All these people work in the form of, it work in the field of architecture and design. The panel, do you mind going down and introducing yourselves and real quickly explaining whether or not, in your introduction, our, our, uh, augmented reality has already started to play a role in your work? Great. Hi, I'm Jim Martin. I'm the CIO of Shepley Bullfinch. We are a national architecture firm. Um, I'm from the office in Boston. Uh, we are doing a lot of VR and less AR. Um, we're starting to figure out how to use the content we're generating for one for the other. Uh, I'm actually more interested in what AR can do for the future of architecture um, than any really great ex examples of what we've already done. Aviad Almagor, I'm the director of the Mixed Reality Program at Trimble. If I were ask a no to your uh, question, I will lose my job. So uh, <laughs> it's very re relevant. That's what I'm doing actually 24 hours a day, looking for ways to bring mixed reality and augmented reality into the architectural and the building industry. Hi, I'm Cody Nowak, uh, Director of Research and Development at Martin Brothers, the premier drywall framing company of Southern California. Um, we are utilizing uh, VR, AR, and MR in our workflows as of today. Um, we've had the opportunity to actually partner with Aviat and Trimble uh, to do uh, a few apps, uh, which is uh, pretty exciting. Um, and based on that relationship, uh, we were able to get uh, early hands-on with HoloLens, which allowed us to um, jump and create a platform where we're pushing uh, BIM files through to the HoloLens in mixed reality, and we actually created a proof of concept based on that for building uh, construction layout. Hi, I'm Amy Corte. I'm a partner at Aero Street. We're an architecture firm, and we're using VR and AR to create design experiences for both ourselves and then create immersive client experiences using those tools. Um, and to do that, we're using the gaming engine of Unity. Um, and then really customizing the user interfaces, because that's where we believe that um, our clients and ourselves engage it the most. I'm David Boyce, also a principal at Arrow Street. And uh, as Amy said, we are using it in our practice right now. And we're actually really looking for ways to use it in the future. More integration with contractors, uh, with the construction trades, and with ultimately with owners in the long run. So Amy kind of gestured to it. but. Um some of you are always less clear. You're using this both in the internal process of your work and in the point where you're showing clients or partners, hey, here's what we've created. Mm -hmm. I can see, uh, we probably all can imagine, if we were having a building designed for us, it would be amazing to see a rendering of it in AR, VR, MR, mixed, mixed martial arts reality. Um, but if you could uh, uh, elaborate on, does this, how, how and why does this enhance, any of you want to take this, how does it enhance your own uh, your own work process. I mean, you guys are, are pros who have been working, obviously, in 3D software your whole careers, but why is it that when you inhabit it in AR and VR that it actually changes the nature of what you can do? Anyone want to take that? Sure. Uh, so uh, from my personal experience with uh, having hands-on with VR and putting end users, clients, in VR, uh, we're able to do design validation and coordination. So placing an end user in the built environment before it's built is incredibly valuable in the fact that we're able to actually do design options, change design options, and do that design validation. It's huge. Uh, it saves a lot of money downstream. Uh, so when that end user walks into the space and sees the space, they truly understand what they're getting, right? And same experience uh, we're, we're pushing for anyways with mixed reality, right? So there's an as-built environment potential. Uh, we'll walk in with uh, something like a HoloLens mixed reality and be able to see the different uh, design options within that actual space. Yeah, Connecting the digital and the physical for us is uh, one of the main benefits of using mixed reality, being able to visualize either a design which does not exist yet or a process of construction uh, using mixed reality is something which provides much better understanding for the professional user, but also for the owners and other stakeholders about where we are in the process and how good and what the quality of the design. So have any of you been in, been in a point on a project where you're doing the design work yourself, forgetting even the, the showing the rendering to a client, and you've actually inhabited the project somehow in, in augmented reality and you said, oh my god, I'm so glad I did this in AR because had, had I not, I would have not realized this mistake or I would have really hated this 
the way this atrium looks or whatever it is until too far down the process? Like, is there, a, is it really adding value in that sense for you as, as yeah. in, in think, the artistry of your, of your work? So we, we've experienced that in VR at this point because we're farther ahead in, in our VR work. But we did have a situation where we had designed and detailed something that we thought was really well thought out. And when we looked at it in, you know, in the space, in, in what would have a simulation of what we would have really built, we realized it would have been a huge mistake and we were able to fix that well in advance of even showing it to the clients. What, what was the mistake that you, that you were only able to realize? It wasn't it was a mistake. It was just we would have designed it differently. <laughs> it would have been a mistake. <laughs> it was a different design that was so much better. I mean, we've also been doing it for our clients before the building is designed. And so putting them in the space when you have a crude um, depiction of what the space could be and getting them to focus on what would be, say, the back of the building or some insignificant portion of the experience. And for them to realize that, oh, this is a major part of you know, what I should be focusing on as an owner, what my you know, end user, what my resident is going to look at, let's you know, make sure we have enough attention and plan for enough resources for the design in that case. Um, that's huge for us. Yeah, we have something very similar. Um, we actually use virtual reality as a design, as a decision engine. So as we go through and use the tools that we use to document our design options, we have a very easy time understanding what it all looks like. But a lot of the people who we're collaborating with don't. So virtual reality, immersive AR is starting to look like it's going to start to do this for us as well. It's a great way of helping us understand what our clients are actually seeing and make sure that what they're seeing is what we actually intend for them to see. And it really, uh, it is a fantastic trigger for them to be able to make much more confident decisions much earlier in the process. Yeah, before it's actually built, exactly. <laughs> Amen. Before it becomes a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, maybe so, one, one more comment on this. Uh, architectural design is a very iterative process. And yeah. if you can accelerate this process by making decisions with confidence, by visualizing the impact of any design decision you are doing using this technology, it's a very helpful process. Uh, There's a quick question for Amy, and please, uh, others on the panel uh, can add in to their response. The idea of uh, community engagement in the design yeah. process and co-creation mm -hmm. of design gets discussed. Are there new pathways for engaging communities that you're experimenting with actively, like in the <laughs> virtual design yeah. studio or in other studios where you're bringing the community voice into the uh, project through AR in, in new ways? And a tag on to that is, new data streams, new pressures on being data-driven in the design process when we're engaging AR technologies. So the first part of that is community engagement. Mm -hmm. The second is new types of data that are informing your design process. Yeah, and we're starting to bring it into the Boston, um, kind of the city reviews and that review process. And what we've really learned and found is VR especially is such an um, individual experience that we've had to change our meeting structure how we um, kind of facilitate those meetings. And so having one person in the VR headset and, or the AR headset and everybody staring at them is obviously not the right way to go. And you have to change your way that you organize the meeting, how you talk about the meeting, what that person is seeing, and how that's viewed on the screen so that people are looking at the screen and what that person is seeing rather than the person themselves. And I think from the data side of it, what we're looking forward to and exploring with the Microsoft HoloLens is how we can layer the data that is fairly opaque in our Revit models and actually make it more intuitive when we're looking at that through AR. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, I'm really looking forward to the day that the HoloLens and customized hardware really isn't necessary, because mm -hmm. I think that's going to be incredibly freeing. And at the same time, I'm uh, slightly horrified at the prospect of the amount of data that's coming in us that we would like to actually overlay on top of the real world. So if you can look at the walls in this room and actually have information about their acoustic properties and about the, mm -hmm. the cost of the actual object and you know, the, the maintenance schedule, if there is one for a particular piece of something or other, I mean, all that information is available. And if you can start to look at an object and understand you know, in its physical location much more about it, you know, I think that's where it starts to become really interesting. Because AR specifically is around layering information on top of a physical environment and being able to kind of shuffle through those layers and see all the different things. How is this constructed? What materials were used? Um, what are those properties? That sort of but, stuff. But uh, you know, we, we're also using it, we're working with the MBTA, we're using real-time data collection to uh, evaluate existing um, stations 
and evaluate how those can be redesigned to function much better. So being able to create computer models, generate that, and, and visualize how their, how their station works now, and with subtle changes, how it will work in the future. And even pilot some of these changes, perhaps, and see in real yeah. time right. what results yeah. from these changes. Brian, please. Uh, uh, there any questions from the audience? Now would be time. We're at the end. If you could come up to a mic, sir, because this session's been. We'll give it two minutes. Two minutes. We started a little yeah, late. Two minutes. The lightning round format here. Uh, like in the 50s, archi I mean, architects were free to the imaginations. As the tools get complicated, like AutoCAD and Revit, uh, I see that all the architects are becoming a slave of their tools. And uh, AR is kind of a, new, a completely new start. And uh, how do you see that the imagination, the free imagination of designing things, mm -hmm. and Will, uh, how do you want to change it that architecture becomes fun again and being in an architecture office becomes fun again instead of being slaves sitting in front of screens? <laughs> sure. I, I would say uh, real time has a, a huge impact on that, right? So you're doing real time rendering, real time lighting of a, a Revit model, right? One click, you're in VR and you're, you have an avatar, you're essentially walking through uh, a game and you're able to make changes in Revit in real time, materials, lighting, uh, elements and it updates in real time in VR, right? Yeah, but or I, even mixed reality. Yeah, but the thing which gets forgotten, Utsun built the Sydney uh, Opera House much before that, and it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff built today is, I, I see the imagination getting disappearing. <laughs> so the, the quick iteration is beautiful, but if you can't imagine anything, then you can iterate as fast as you can, you'll still not get anywhere. And what we'll do, in the interest <laughs> of time, uh, because we'll have to wrap on this panel. We will continue this discussion. It's a very, we've got a strong point of view on the mic, and that is about the design process and being mm -hmm. slaves to tools, mm -hmm. and how do we um, think about uh, this, this dichotomy between the technology and, and the human experience, and how do we give room for both the design process, and, yeah. and how is design education transforming Changing. to meet these issues? Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, you want to close? Any thoughts, final thoughts? Well, actually, I would just say, do any of you want to take on that last point? Does any, uh, anyone want to say that we are at the end? I mean, I don't, I don't know what architecture we should have been visiting, but maybe not the right ones. But, <laughs> you know, there's, there is certainly an adoption curve that has to happen with any technology whenever it's uh, adopted. And the early adopters on that curve are generally trying to figure out how the tool works more so than trying to figure out what the design looks like. But with the explosion of, of materials that are available to us to construct buildings, um, you know, the tools that we use, I think, are, are really adequate for the kinds of buildings that we're being asked to produce with our clients. And I don't know, we don't seem to have a problem finding really interesting moments and really interesting aspects of the design. I think this building is actually a pretty good example of that. It's a really nice building. Um, it's not the Sydney Opera House, but frankly, there's only one of those, so you can only have one Sydney Opera House. So stick around for the art and design panel that's coming on right yeah. behind this one. This theme isn't going away in this set of panels. Panelists, thank you so much. Audience, thank you. Brian, thank you. Thank you.